entertainers. They're today's royalty, yet some embrace careers their parents would never have approved of. Would you let your daughter make a living fulfilling men's fantasies? Your son switch genders to perform in cabaret. Would you pierce your body to thrill an audience? How far would you go to entertain others? What does it take to entertain? For those who live at the edge of extreme entertainment, it usually requires a transformation. Trading oneself for another. Letting go of inhibitions. And taking the audience on a journey they'd never dare take alone. Would you put your life at risk for other people's pleasure? There's a group of performers who do. They're modern day sideshow performers. People who make a living by doing the unthinkable, the stomach churning, the death defying. All just to entertain an audience. In Toronto, Canada, ringmaster Scott McClelland takes the stage. For Scott, whose stage name is Nikolai Diablo, shocking a willing audience is a full-time profession. While others might spend their time toiling in offices, Scott eats razor blades drinks boiling water, and hammers nails up his nose. We brought to the public something that was sorely needed in our plastic, humdrum, yuppieized world. Sideshows are selling thrills, from new acts to age-old stunts like sword swallowing. In Carnival Diablo, Vanessa Neal keeps alive a long and perilous tradition. So many people before me have died on stage sword swallowing. And that's what the audience is buying. The very real danger that these performers will seriously injure themselves or even die right before their very eyes. There's a morbid sense of curiosity that draws the audiences in constantly because we are taking our life into our own hands. When they're there in the audience, they are hoping that maybe tonight might be the night where the big accident takes place. And I think that's one of the reasons people come because if they can't take the risk themselves, at least they can witness it. Carnival Diablo has gained a loyal audience because it taps into a very basic human urge. Sideshows and freak shows are ways of showing us what it would be like to live out our fantasies. Carolyn Marvin is a professor of anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. Of course, human beings have violent fantasies. One way to keep them under control is to have them be organized for us. For a moment, we can focus on them, we can imagine them, and then we can leave them behind. For years, the best place to do that was under the tent of the traveling circus, a place Scott has known since childhood. Well, my grandfather owned the largest traveling circus sideshow in Canada. 
from 1920 through 1968. I was aware at a very young age that my grandmother could swallow seven swords. Also, that my grandfather was known as a human pincushion. What could be more inspiring to an impressionable boy? Scott knew he wanted to follow in his grandfather's footsteps. But by the 1960s, sideshows had lost their appeal. Freak shows came to be seen as exploitive. Sideshow acts dismissed as crude and old hat. But then came the 1990s. A new generation rediscovered the body's potential as art, and the sideshow was reborn. You're seeing more and more people walking around with piercings and tattoos. They almost seem to be attracted to it because it's becoming familiar. They feel an affinity to what's going on on stage. Tapping into this craze, Scott launched Carnival Diablo in 1992. His biggest challenge? Keeping several steps ahead of the latest extreme. Tonight, Scott holds a rehearsal at his house. It's actually good to run. He's ready to show off a new routine. And this is position one. A handmade variation of Russian roulette. Last year, I was playing a game of Russian roulette with a uh, buck knife, and I put the knife right through my hand. And you can see the scar there. I lost the game miserably. Now, I am willing tomorrow night to do something that's equally as stupid by playing a game of Russian roulette with a nine inch long galvanized construction spike. I am going to have to crush three bags and leave one standing. This is going to be good. I'm very trepidatious about doing it, but it's time to get back on the horse. Sideshows must do one of two things, shock or disgust. Vanessa is a master at the disgusting part. Once a week, she buys props for what many call Carnival Diablo's most revolting act. Probably about eight years ago, we were doing our first rehearsal, and I popped it right in my mouth, crunch, crunch, uh, swallow. No problem. Oh, nice. I'm going to eat the worms. Wow. Mm -hmm. They're my favorite. They're so much fun. <laughs> Coming up, meet a performer at the extreme edge of Sideshow. And later, step into the secret world of the Japanese geisha. It's showtime at Carnival Diablo. Backstage, a striking transformation is underway. Before they face the knives, nails, and swords, the performers must alter themselves, mentally and physically, for the dangers ahead. When I started with Carnival Diablo, there was such a challenge to really face your fears, you know, do something that you just never, ever expected yourself to be able to do. Like maybe eat live insects. Vanessa warms up the audience with a light snack. A handful of crawling crickets. Followed by a mouthful of wriggling earthworms. It's an act guaranteed to incite the crowd. You know, when people are disgusted, uh, they have two kinds of reactions. One is a sort of a disgust face and but the other one is laughter. Paul Rosen is a professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. And that laughter is sort of a nervous kind of laughter. All of these sensitivities are very much tuned by culture. There are many cultures that eat insects. Shall we begin? Yeah! Few acts inspire as much audience anxiety as playing with sharp objects. Place your bets! It's time to play! Carney Roulette! It's the moment Scott's been dreading, but he's ready to risk impaling his hand on a nine-inch spike. 
Intuitively, he knows how to keep the audience on the edge of their seats. When we watch people do extreme things, one of the things we're seeing is our own imagination at work. We're watching people survive ordeals that we actually wouldn't attempt ourselves. And so it's all right in the end because the person who is performing the extreme act goes away whole, apparently. So we don't have to suffer the consequences of this kind of behavior. And yet, we get to imaginatively participate in it and see what it would be like. And that's why you're paying to see us, because the fact that we're transcending so many ideas of what you can't do in life these days. Everybody has rules, and we're constantly trying to break them. And those who can't break the rules themselves will happily pay to see others do it for them. It's entertainment. It's funny when someone else gets hurt. <laughs> I just think it's absolutely interesting. I think it's great that people do all kinds of weird stuff like that. I think the motivator is, is just be, to do something different. I mean, everyone just does the standard thing. Go to a movie, go to dinner, eat some fire. That's different. <laughs> It is the same type of fascination, I think, that you get uh, with people uh, rubbernecking at a car wreck. Gerald Urchak is a professor of anthropology at Skidmore College. Perhaps the car isn't even in the road. It's off to the side, but traffic slows down and is backed up for 18 miles because everybody wants to see. In the world of extreme acts, Few can rival Tim Cridlin. His stage name is Zamora, the Torture King. His game, self-mutilation. Skewers going through the arms, exit wounds, entrance. His cheeks are permanently scarred from shoving hundreds of skewers through them. Anywhere else? Do that every night. And, I... and bruises mark the spots where sewing needles have been woven into his skin. Unlike Scott, Tim is not an offspring of circus performers. His fascination with pushing his body to the limit began at age 10 with a book about strange performers through history. The fact is, I'm just kind of emulating from the past. In fact, that's pretty much what I, what I specialize in, uh, kind of replicating these things that are um, completely lost in a way. I swallow this light bulb. One of Tim's most popular acts is eating a light bulb. I want to see if it's a little more than I can chew. And I got a hammer over here. I guess there's no turning back. The highlight of Tim's act is when he slides a razor-sharp skewer all the way through his arm. Some people find this fascinating, disgusting, but fascinating. Other people can't watch it. But Tim claims he never feels a thing. I've kind of linked up my mind and body in a way that if I, I choose not to feel pain, I can, I can overcome that. The fascination is to safely watch other people performing these taboo acts. And for most of us, not only are they taboo, if we tried them ourselves, we would really be hurt. Obviously, this is something no one should attempt at home. But Tim, has ways of protecting his body. Actually, lower my blood pressure. That's one of the reasons it doesn't bleed as much as you think it would. It's a trick he learned from some Eastern cultures, where worshipers torture themselves as part of age-old rituals. From Thailand to Bali to Nepal, it's a way of getting in touch with the gods. 
These types of activities are associated with people who have deep, deep faith in their belief system and in what they're doing. These are not, you know, Sunday service people. If they believe that spirits enter their body or that they can summon a spirit to make them strong, uh, they really believe it, and uh, that probably makes it easier for them to do it, though. In the West, sideshow performers like Tim use the same techniques, but to entertain a paying audience. But people don't just do this to make a buck. In Tim's case, it's to satisfy his curiosity and see just how far he can go. No blood, no pain, ladies and gentlemen. That is mind over matter. I kind of got into this because I'm actually really curious about the world. I'm really, I think, way beyond what other people are. And as I said, I don't want to like, kind of have a superficial knowledge of something. I want to go deep into it. As for Vanessa, she's inspired by the audience and by challenging them to see themselves in an entirely new way makes people totally second-guess everything they thought was possible with a human being. And that's fantastic. When it comes to second-guessing or doing a double take, few performers can rival the cabaret stars of Thailand. Look closely, because every one of these women was born a man. How would you like to headline in a transsexual cabaret? In other countries, women usually take the lead in cabaret. But here in Thailand, many feel they're just not the right gender for the job. In Thai society, women are usually very prim and proper. This profession requires them to be outgoing, cheeky and brazen, which is not proper for Thai women. Women have thoughts that are special for women, and men have thoughts that are manly. But lady boys have a combination, so we can be more expressive. In the West, if a boy wanted to become a woman, he'd probably keep his desire secret, but not in Thailand. Here, lady boys, or men who decide to become women, are much more open, especially on the stage. In Thailand, as well as in Japan, there's this idea that only a man can portray the perfect woman. Andrew Matzner is a lecturer at Holland's University. The epitome of femininity can only be enacted by a male. That is the prevalent idea in theater performance in Thailand. Femininity is based on artifice. And who better to be an expert at artifice than an actor? So every night in cabarets across Thailand, performers transform themselves in the most profound way imaginable. From men into women. Meet Anne. She's a beauty queen with a dressing room full of trophies. When this lady boy's on stage, men drool. The transformation seems complete. In the West, performers like Anne might be confined to more underground venues. But Anne has won her trophies at transvestite beauty contests, held at fairs and festivals all over Thailand. Spectators often comment that these beauty queens are more beautiful than women. You can purchase birth control pills over the counter. 
in Thailand. So oftentimes, adolescents who identify as transgendered are, are able to, through birth control pills, through hormones, they're able to develop a female body from early on in life, and that allows them to become very convincing. Anne made the decision to live as a woman before her body had even begun to reach manhood. I decided I was like this around fifth or sixth grade, around 10 or 11 years old. I chose it even though my parents were against it, and I was very stubborn and determined. Now Anne lives with her boyfriend in Bangkok. He hasn't told his mother about their relationship yet and prefers to keep his identity secret. But to him, Anne is the best girlfriend he's ever had. I don't consider myself gay. There is nothing about Anne that is like a man. But in a very real sense, that's not true. Anne may have had breast implants, but she still fits the legal definition of a man. In my profession, you really don't need to have the bottom part done. But for me, it enhances my femininity, and I'll do it for my boyfriend. What makes this taboo, what makes the cabarets so so fascinating, I think, for Thai people and for people from all over the world is that boundaries of nature are being crossed. We assume that when a baby is born male, that baby's going to grow up to be a man. When that baby boy grows up to become a beautiful woman, we are fascinated. We also understand some line has been crossed. And so for some people, there are very negative feelings. With her in-between gender status, Anne encounters these negative feelings often. There was an incident once when I traveled to Singapore to work. When we landed at the Singapore airport, at the immigration desk, the minute they looked at my passport and it had the prefix Mr., they asked me if I was a man, and I replied yes. The minute they heard my voice, they knew I was a man. They then started to wonder about my visit. Anne was held like a prisoner at the airport until the Singapore cabaret could vouch for her. The experience left her frightened profoundly aware that to many people, her lifestyle would always be unacceptable. Coming up, meet the ladyboy who's taken Thailand by storm. And later, take a peek behind the closed doors of the world of the geisha. In Thailand, ladyboys were dancers and entertainers long before cabaret caught on in the 1970s. But its enormous success has given them a special niche and allowed them to become more open in expressing themselves. One has even turned stardom on the cabaret stage into national celebrity. The artist known simply as Day. Day is the author of two books. And though she's never had a sex change operation, she lives her life entirely as a woman, on stage and off. It's been a radical transformation from a young boy who yearned to entertain. I always loved to perform as a child, singing or acting whenever there was a chance. At 17, Day had to quit school to help support her family. Working as a hairdresser, she got in on the ground floor of the blossoming field of cabaret. I had to slowly inject more and more of my personality and myself into the act so that I could stand out and be different. 
To insert too much of yourself might also turn people off, but there's a balance. Day's stardom has given her the latitude to live the life she wants. And even adopt two sons. In the West, virtually everything about this man slash woman would be taboo. Her gender, her motherhood, her lifestyle. So why is she accepted in Thailand? Transgenderism isn't bound up in sinfulness the way it is in the West. According to Christianity, homosexuality, cross-dressing, those are considered to be sinful. Whereas according to Buddhism, generally um, transgenderism is bound up in karma. A person is born transgendered because of something they did wrong in a prior life. As a result, overt harassment is rare here. But that doesn't mean most Thais approve of transgenderism. Dr. Wanlo Piamanaram is a psychologist. He's concerned about how ladyboys are affecting Thailand's reputation. People have invested a lot of money in cabaret, but the image is not good. The message is not positive. Every big hotel has it now, but foreigners don't appreciate it or admire it. They see it as something very strange and weird. But what does the audience think? Why is cabaret so popular in Thailand? It's very colorful and artistic, and nobody can do it as well as here in Thailand. For me personally, I think it's good. They have a very special talent. I like it because it's creative in a different way. When people don't like it, it's because they don't understand this group of people. But what makes these performers acceptable may be the fact that they are performers, existing in a space outside everyday reality. Transvestitism on stage is different from transvestitism in the street for most people, because the stage is understood to be a place where we're going to break the rules. It's a safe place to imagine what if we were doing something different with our gender, something fundamentally different than we're supposed to do. It's a similar story in advertising, film, and television soap operas. Lady boys are acceptable only as long as they stick to stereotypical roles. And though Thailand is renowned for its tolerance, even a celebrity like Day often feels that many are uncomfortable with her lifestyle. It is not words that bother me, but looks. As if people are looking down at us. Even deciding which bathroom to use can be an issue. We have to look at ourselves and decide which bathroom we are ready to go into. I'm not there to peek at someone. If we are dressed like men, we should go into the men's room, and if we are dressed as women, the ladies' room. We shouldn't think of Thailand as being a paradise for transgender people. Some people are very accepting, some people are not. Um, so a person may be beaten in their family. Uh, at the workplace level, depending on the profession, discrimination definitely can exist. But concerns like these tend to disappear at the cabaret. For Thailand's ladyboys, it's a refuge. Once we are on the cabaret stage, people are in awe, and they are not laughing or feel disgusted like they may in other circumstances. Cabaret is not just a profession for us. It is not just a livelihood. It is something that sustains us. It is like the air that we breathe. 
For many entertainers, especially those on the extreme, the stage is the place they feel most free to express themselves. But what if your kind of performance required you to give up yourself and become somebody else? To embrace a role that takes all your waking hours in pursuit of someone else's vision. How far would you go to fulfill a man's fantasy of what a woman ought to be? In Kyoto today, they're a mysterious relic of old Japan. Painted dolls that scurry through the streets before disappearing behind closed doors. Are they high-priced courtesans, mistresses of seduction, or something more elusive? There's a lot of mystery to being a geisha, I think. The society seems very closed and secret. I think they're high-priced prostitute. <laughs> Geisha's role is for entertainment. I wouldn't like the idea of serving men. I believe in equal rights for men and women. Uh, I guess a geisha is whatever the customer wants, really. Whatever a geisha is, it's more than a role. It's an all-encompassing way of life. Uma Chika is a maiko, a second-year apprentice. She's still adjusting to the changes. When I first started, there were many times that I was scolded and I didn't even know why. Then I realized that this geisha world is so different from the world I used to know. In past generations, most girls were born into the trade or sold into it by destitute parents. Umachika made the choice herself. She would trade her identity and her family for a new life as a geisha. Since I was a little girl, I always admired apprentice geisha and wanted to be one. But the first time I told my parents, my father said, absolutely no way. But I still really wanted to be a geisha, so I came to Kyoto. Kyoto is Japan's cultural heart. In an increasingly westernized country, it's one of the last places where strict geisha training continues. All the geisha live in restricted quarters in the city, the only places where you're likely to see them. Umachika began knocking on doors. But everyone said she was too old at 19 to start training. But then she found Umeno, a retired geisha who runs a small tea house. Umeno took one look at the young woman and decided she had the face of a geisha. She gave her a new name based on her own, and Umachika was born. But that was only the beginning of a long, grueling path. To become a geisha, it takes a lot of training. Many leave because they can't take the training. Mary White is a professor of anthropology at Boston University. It's a very hard life. They are under a contract to a geisha house usually, which would be their, you know, their house where they would live as well. And they would very, have very few times when they, for example, could go home to visit their parents. For five years, Umachika must submit to geisha boot camp. A rule or a tradition governs everything she does. Every 10 days, the hairdresser twists and pulls her hair into the Maiko's traditional style. The pressure is so strong, it produces a permanent bald spot. Every night, she must sleep on a rigid cushion that keeps her awake, just to maintain her hairstyle. Her routine follows the same pattern every day. 
with almost no time for herself. Classes consume half of it. The rest is spent preparing herself for an evening of clients. Her signature makeup is so elaborate, it takes an hour and a half. Once, the makeup had lead in it, which would prematurely age a geisha's face. Every day, Umachika must transform the girl she is into a traditional icon of feminine beauty. And she goes through all this effort just to achieve a look designed hundreds of years ago to stand out in candlelight. I have seen so many girls just quit, but that only strengthens my resolve. If I quit now, all those things I had put up with and worked so hard on would become meaningless. Mama Umeno dresses her, but it's not with a mother's loving hands. She's a businesswoman, and Umachika is her prize investment. The tea house foots the bill for all her training, including hundreds of thousands of dollars for lavish kimonos and accessories. In return, Mama takes all of her income. Umachika receives no salary and gets just two days off a month. In the West, an arrangement like this would be outlawed. Here, it's the path to an exalted, if mysterious, position in Japanese society. What most Japanese businessmen think when they think geisha is a person through which they can demonstrate their power and their status. A businessman, if he has the funds, he's going to be able to take his clients, his customers, and his colleagues out to a geisha evening. But you don't do that just through money. You have to do it through connections. You're showing your networks as well as your money. Say geisha to a Westerner, and most people think high-class hooker. But though it's true that some early geishas were prostitutes, the profession actually evolved from court entertainers in the 1600s. The word geisha itself, of course, doesn't mean prostitute at all. It means artistic person. But the art itself is the art of a special kind of allure, even seduction. The arts that a geisha would purvey would be dancing, wonderful uh, ancient dances of the court, and they'd play musical instruments as well, and the arts of conversation and literature. But in today's Japan, few are willing to work so hard to learn the geisha's arts. One person who rejected the lifestyle is Mama Umeno's own daughter, Yuko. In the past, a geisha's daughter would follow her mother into the trade, but Yuko said no. If I were a Maiko or a geisha, the things I would really miss would be activities that other girls enjoy, but I wouldn't have the freedom to do. Like driving a car, going to dinner, or karaoke with friends, or traveling. Yet to wealthy Japanese men, the rigor of Maiko training is all part of the mystique. Peter McIntosh is a Canadian, but he too fell under the geisha spell 10 years ago when he came to live in Japan. I guess it's just something you don't see anywhere else in the world. When you see these beautifully kimono-clad women walking through the streets, it just says, paint me, photograph me, write a poem about me. It's just something that really grabs you. And Peter puts his money where his mouth is. Alien though it may seem to most Western men to spend thousands of dollars on a dancing girl who keeps her clothes on, Peter says he could have a Ferrari for all he spent on geishas. But to him, 
entering this exclusive world is worth every penny. What it's all basically about is when you make that first step inside the tea house, you're supposed to forget about that all the worries that went on that day. And what the major thing that customers are so relaxed about is what goes on behind closed doors stays behind closed doors, or should. Coming up, how far will a geisha go to please a client? For the most powerful men in Japan, the tea house is their fantasy world. A place to relax, discuss a little business, and let their hair down. For Umachika, it's showtime. And since she's still learning, a nerve-wracking lesson in entertaining men often twice her age. <laughs> now Suza is a full-fledged geisha who knows all the tricks of the trade. An evening with a geisha to most especially Western perceptions is a seduction of a kind. That is, you're supposed to end up in bed with a geisha. Well, in fact, what she does is tease and cajole. She boosts your ego. She makes every little word you say sound like it, you know, it came out of Shakespeare. And she's really a past mistress of that art of making the man feel good, short of going to bed. For the men, just being close to the geisha seems to be enough. These geisha represent something beyond my everyday world. To meet these extraordinary women is in a way a learning opportunity and a way to elevate myself to a superior being. The geisha who are attending to the men are precious commodities. They are like being close to the crown jewels. A Westerner might think that a geisha is in the room listening to men and, and following their every whim and catering to them. But actually what a geisha is doing is manipulating and organizing. She's the powerful person in the room. The men are waiting for cues from her. What game are we going to play next? Am I up to it? As the evening unfolds, conversation makes way for drinking games. Umachika realizes a bit too late that she's going to have to learn to pace herself. Every move a geisha makes is supposed to be perfect. But in her excitement, Umachika spills the sake. It's a tense moment. She hopes the other guests didn't notice. But her graceful dancing makes up for tonight's blunders. Half a century ago, the virginity of a maiko like Umachika would often be auctioned to the highest bidder to mark the end of her training. That practice is outlawed now. Most of her customers barely come close enough to touch her. But that doesn't mean they don't have fantasies. If I tell you I have no ulterior motive, it would be a lie. Of course there is an ulterior motive. But restraining this desire is the joy and beauty of it. But what's the beauty of it for Uma Chika as she struggles with her training regimen? What keeps a girl who loves Eminem committed to the life of a geisha? I can do things that a normal schoolgirl can't do. For instance, I can go to see kabuki theater in these clothes and go to expensive restaurants with clients. I can talk to people I can't meet normally, dignitaries and CEOs of major corporations. And Umachika gets to perform in special festivals to show off her skills as a dancer. It's the realization of her childhood dreams. Of course, every once in a while, 
I wish that I could just be a normal girl. But it's like once or twice a year. It is hard, but I know I'm doing something that I really enjoy. And that's why I can endure it. It's a life that few young girls today choose to pursue. But an ancient calling that links them to entertainers all over the world. Becoming a geisha is so much investment in hard work and training that you might wonder what is, after all, the payoff. A young woman trying to become a geisha these days, and they are few, is thinking, I am part of old Japan. It's not the men that they're pleasing, it's their art. From indulging our taste for exclusive gratification, to breaking all the rules of gender, and the limits of the human body. Extreme entertainers help us live out our fantasies safely. People have to live civilized lives, but their imaginations aren't civilized at all. Their imaginations do all kinds of wild and uncivilized things. So there's a kind of relief or release in seeing the things that, in fact, we can't do every day in life. It's a vacation for our imagination to see this possibility. By balancing on the edge of the taboo, extreme entertainers take us places only our imaginations dare to go.